are going to actually dialogue back and forth throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about the legal requirements under FERPA and Kelly will share her practical experiences based on how, how some of these requirements and best practices have played out uh, with city year. So as Juliana mentioned, please ask questions. I know there'll be time at the end of the presentation, but we're um, also open to questions in the chat. So um, I mentioned this was a timely topic, but it's definitely not a new, a new topic. Um, districts have always had this really difficult task of meeting the needs of all their students and providing a well-rounded education. Um, and I think that has been a challenge even in normal times, uh, but um, you know, they're faced with shrinking resources, with increased accountability. And then when you throw in the pandemic, it can feel next to impossible, I think, for districts to, to meet this task alone. Um, and so the focus today is really on out of school or after school programs um, and why and how you can share data with those programs. Um, and so broadly, what we're gonna talk about are that range of programs that promote and um, enhance the development of, of youth outside of the regular school day, uh, the ability to partner with outside groups to administer um, academic, social, recreational, and vocational programs. Um, those can be comprehensive programs that offer a number of different services like tutoring, um, academic achievement, uh, parent and family engagement, um, physical fitness and job readiness programs. Um, and again, the, the programs have historically played a really significant role in improving educational outcomes for districts and their students. And I know Kelly is going to discuss some of the statistics and the impact that, um, specifically with City Years programming here in a second. Um, but over the past year, we've seen an increase um, in the importance and the need for these programs as tools to help students re-engage and reconnect and thrive. Um, Kelly, if you could go to the next slide, we'll talk. Um, we mentioned just a minute ago that districts have received funding um, in the COVID relief packages. So I just wanted to spend a, a quick second talking about these funds. Um, over the past year, uh, Congress has actually passed three different stimulus bills that have provided nearly $190 billion to the elementary and secondary uh, emergency education relief fund or ESSER. Um, these have allowed state educational agencies and districts to use uh, funds to prepare, pre uh, prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. Um, and they're designed to uh, help districts explore creative ways to address learning loss. Um, the last plan, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, actually included specific carve-outs carve for SEAs and districts to um, support the implementation of evidence-based interventions. Um, and those carve-outs actually required or included a requirement that uh, half of the SEA portion or about 5% of the total amount of grant funds that were awarded to the state and 20% of the local distributions to schools uh, be spent to address learning loss by um, supporting the implementation of evidence-based interventions. And one of those interventions was actually specifically called out uh, for comprehensive after-school programs. Um, there's a component to this uh, that you know also requires the SEAs and the districts to ensure that those interventions uh, respond to the student's academic, social, and emotional needs and address the dis disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on students. Um, so we're gonna talk about ways that data might be able to help uh, you do that um, and, and meet those requirements for the funding in the first place. Um, so the funds obviously are creating new opportunities for districts to increase access to some of these um, existing after school summer uh, or, or summer learning opportunities for students that may not have been present uh, pre pandemic. And many districts are establishing or sort of bolstering those relationships that they may have had with, um, you know, local community groups that provide after school and summer learning programs um, to offer youth more opportunities to engage. And so City Year is one of those programs. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kelly at this point to provide a little bit more context about after school programs generally, um, any comments you may have about the recently authorized funding streams and then information about City Year, uh, their approach and sort of how they're working with districts to help them meet the needs of students. Great, thanks, Sarah. Okay, so some quick context on City Year so that you can understand where I'm coming from in this conversation as we're using City Year as just one example of this. So City Year, as, as I mentioned, we work in 29 cities across the country, 51 school districts. Um, and so we're in about 350 schools serving about 225,000 students. Um, and we bring together teams of young adult AmeriCorps members to provide that service in systemically under-resourced schools. So our core members 
are ages 18 to 25. They're near peers with the students that they're serving. Um, the majority are college graduates and people of color um, and from lower income backgrounds who are interested in education, interested in giving back to their communities, really want to serve and bring those developmentally um, sound relationships into their service with students. Hey Kelly, sorry to interrupt. Um, do you think you might um, try switching to the phone to see if that might work better? Oh uh, yes. Let me let me turn off my video too. That yeah, might help. no no problem at all. All right, let's keep our fingers crossed. Thank you all for your patience. I'm so sorry about that technology. Never never working in my favor these days. All right, so. In full disclosure, we're here to talk about um, after school, out of school time programs. Sidier is not solely an out of school time program. Um, we are a holistic service model through the school day and during extended learning time in the morning and during after school. Um, and so we're really focused on providing support in the classroom and outside of the classroom to ensure students are getting the supports they need academically and social emotionally to improve their attendance, their behavior, and their academic performance. Uh, but we do focus a ton of attention into extended learning time. And then as Sarah mentioned, we have some of our many results. These are uh, results from a couple of external survey or external studies that we've done. Um, the research from Policy Studies Associates has shown that schools that partner with Sidier are two to three times more likely to improve their school-wide performance on state English and math assessments. And then the Everyone Graduate Center at Johns Hopkins University just released in May of last year a study about the time spent with our City or AmeriCorps members um, and found that the more time spent with our core members, the better students' social, academic, emotional, and attendance outcomes were. And the greatest gains were when um, academics were integrated with social emotional learning activities as well, which really falls in line with what's happening with the ESSER 3 funds and the focus on learning loss and the integrated academic and social emotional evidence-based intervention that Sarah already mentioned. Okay, I think it's back to me. So, um, you know, Kelly talked about some of the benefits of after school programs in general. Um, one of the, you know, our focus today is really on data sharing and uh, why and how districts may want to share data back and forth with their community partners. Um, and so this is a slide that talks about some of those key benefits um, that can come with coordinated data sharing between schools and their community partners. So uh, the goal is to, you know, develop targeted programs um, that, you know, effectively target those limited resources and schools and make sure that they're getting to the communities and the students that are most in need. Um, targeting the, the, the individuals who could benefit from participation in these programs. Um, also with updated and comprehensive student and site level information providers are able to um, promote continuous program improvement. Um, there can be increased alignment between the after school provider and the school day uh, to make sure that there's enhanced curriculum opportunities and planning and staff cohesion. Um, also the opportunity to complement and support um, each other uh, to build on the school and the student needs and strengths. And then also the ability to assess the program's impact. So uh, data sharing on things like student attendance and academic achievement uh, allows for more transparency and um, sort of the impact of these programs on student outcomes more generally. And I think that that's really important as we talk about that ESSER 3 fund requirement uh, that, that really does require districts to ensure that these interventions that they're putting in place um, are responding to students' academic, uh, social, and emotional needs and are, are actually successful in uh, addressing that disproportionate impact of the coronavirus. So I think that's something to keep in mind um, and, a, and a key point here. So, so we're going to talk about FERPA because FERPA is typically uh, the um, is typically cited by groups um, to as the most common barrier for for using and sharing data to improve these student educational outcomes. So I think there's a lot of myths and misinterpretations of the privacy laws and regulations um, that keep uh, school districts from participating in data sharing activities that really have the potential to improve. Um, academic outcomes for, for students. So we're gonna talk about those options uh, for permissible data sharing under FERPA 
and I, I'm assuming everybody knows what FERPA is, but that's the Family Rights Educational Rights and Privacy Act, uh, which generally limits when schools can disclose personally identifiable information from education records without the parent or the eligible student's consent. Um, so we're going to talk about three um, permissible data sharing options. We have uh, de-identified de data, um, consent, and then one of the uh, permissible uh, exceptions that allows it under FERPA, and there's actually three underneath that. So a lot of content coming to you on the next couple slides, so I will I will talk fast so we can get into some of the practical implications, but it's a good background here. So um, there are several uh, places throughout FERPA that talk about disclosing um, personally identifiable um, information and, but I think as part of that conversation, you have to think about whether that personally identifiable information needs to be disclosed in the first place. Um, as I mentioned, FERPA prevents schools from disclosing a student's personally identifiable information um, with, without consent, but it doesn't prevent school districts from disclosing or sharing um, de-identified data. Uh, districts can do that without the consent of any party and for any purpose. Um, and sometimes that may be enough to set up or establish one of these relationships. So we talked about the fact that one of the key benefits of sharing data is to effectively target resources to those students who are most in need. Um, can you do that without sharing personally identifiable information? I, I think so in some cases. Um, you know, you can review and share aggregated data um, and identify gaps or needs. So, you know, for example, if you know that 54% of males in grade 11 scored below proficient on an assessment, you can use that information and share that data um, to enter into a relationship with a provider or a community partner that's designed to sort of target males in grade 11 in that specific area. So no personally identifiable information was shared or needed um, in order to reveal that information or make that relationship happen. Um, the thing to be careful about uh, with this one, though, is that the school is only able to release the records after the school has made a reasonable determination that a student's identi identity was not uh, personally identifiable. Um, and sometimes even aggregate data has risks in this area. So if I said 100% of males in grade 11 scored below proficient on an assessment, um, that I'm no longer protecting student identity. Because if I know that you know, Johnny is an 11th grade male student. I now know that he scored below proficient on the assessment and I've now disclosed uh, his personally identifiable information from his education record without his consent. Um, so you still need to pay attention to the data you're disclosing, even if it's an aggregate data. Um, the PTAC document that I listed on the screen actually shares some of the commonly used disclosure avoidance methods. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and then obviously the downside, we're gonna talk about sort of the pros and cons of all these different options, but the downside of limiting disclosure uh, to aggregated or de-identified data is that you don't get to take advantage of some of those other benefits that we talked about earlier, right? So it's easier to assess the impact of your program and sort of make those continuous program improvements when you know the impact you're making on individual students. And so having that PII or personally identifiable information may be helpful. Um, so we're going to talk about another one on the next slide, um, which is consent. Um, so the next permissible way to share data is to obtain written consent from the parent or the eligible student. Um, this is probably the most recommended way, um, and uh, Kelly certainly jump in if you disagree with that. But I think it, you know, it's it's often the most effective way of sharing education records. It may not be the most practical method to use, and I'm sure that there are things. Uh, that Kelly can share from that practical standpoint about uh, hurdles that maybe she's run into with City Year. But under FERPA, a parent, an eligible student, they can provide consent uh, to a third party, such as a community partner, as long as the consent is written, data signed, and does these three things. So needs to specify the education record that may be disclosed, um, state the purpose of the disclosure, and identify the partner or the parties to whom the disclosure may be made. Um, I have a question on there about who's responsible for obtaining the written consent. Uh, FERPA actually doesn't address this. So either the community partner or the um, school district can obtain the consent. Um, FERPA just requires that the parent or the eligible student uh, provide that consent before the district discloses uh, the PII from the student's education record. Um, so there's nothing in FERPA that would prevent a community-based organization from obtaining a signed and dated written consent form as long as the consent meets those requirements. 
Um, you know, I think the best practice is to work together to put together a release form and then work it into the registration materials. Um, I know that there are groups, and I don't know how City Year does it, but I know that there are groups that have, you know, made this an electronic form that parents sign online and that then sort of gets pushed to a database as well. So it can be an electronic authorization as long as um, it identifies and sort of authenticates the person who's signing um, on behalf of the parent or the eligible student. Um, this, you know, may not be practical. Uh, sometimes this, uh, it, you know, there needs to be some sort of buy-in. I think a little bit of the potential benefits that might result from consenting to the disclosure of records. Um, you may not receive consent forms back from everybody. Um, they're kind of a pain. You know, if you've ever been responsible for tracking permission slips, you know, <laughs> it's it's tough to get. Um, and so, it, from a practical standpoint, there may be some hurdles with, with using this one. Um, but it certainly, once you have it. Um, makes it easier for you to sh share that data back and forth. Um, okay, the next slide, we're gonna, we're gonna cover um, three different exceptions then that allow schools and districts to um, disclose personally identifiable information for, from a student's education record um, without the consent of a parent or an eligible student. And um, I also wanna use this opportunity, I'll drop these links into the chat, but there are two great resources um, from the Department of Education on this topic that really do a nice job of walking through these exceptions. Um, so I'll throw those into um, the chat once I wrap up with this portion. Um, but the first one we're gonna talk about is the school official exception. Um, this allows the schools to share information with an organization that's considered to be a school official who has a legitimate educational interest in the record. This only applies if the organization meets these three uh, criteria. So they have to perform an institutional service or function for which the school or LEA would otherwise use employee. Um, they have to be under the direct control of the school regarding the use and maintenance of the records and the organization has to agree not to disclose or use the data outside of the designated purpose. Um, that first bullet is probably the toughest piece to meet on this exception um, for purposes of the conversation today. Um, you know, it asks to take a look at the service or the function that you're outsourcing and ask whether this is something that the district would otherwise use employees for. So for example, if it's an after-school tutoring program, um, for vulnerable students and you're currently using internal staff for this, but you really like a program that's being offered by the center, um, that probably meets this exception. Uh, if it's a you know cool new app or something that just sort of gen generically um, uh, improves instruction for students, um, but may not be a function that the district would otherwise use their own employees to perform, um, that first condition may not be met and um, wouldn't fall under this exception, but certainly might fall underneath another one. Um, the other key piece to this exception, I think, is to make sure that your an annual notification of FERPA rights aligns with who you're designating as a school official under this exception. So you are obligated as a school district to establish criteria in that annual notification about who is a school official and what constitutes a legitimate educational interest. And so you wanna make sure that the group that you're disclosing to and the actual disclosure practice aligns with that criteria. Um, and then finally, make sure that that community-based organization only has access to those records in which they have a legitimate educational interest in and protect against inappropriate redisclosure. And that kind of feeds into this direct control piece of the second bullet. Um, you know, a lot of districts, this is not, this is not an exception that requires a written agreement, but um, I strongly recommend that uh, districts use one as a best practice, and that can go a long way in helping some of these direct control pieces and um, putting um, in some of those safeguards about um, controlling that, the data and protecting against inappropriate redisclosure. Where if this one doesn't work for your needs, um, the next one we're gonna talk about is the studies exception. Um, this is one that allows districts to disclose personally identifiable information to community-based organizations uh, that are conducting studies for or on behalf of schools, so long as those studies will be used for any one of the following purposes. Um, the first one is developing, validating, or administrating predictive tests. Uh, the second one is administering student aid programs. And finally, and probably the most applicable for purposes for, for conversations today is improving instruction. Um, so school districts that use this exception um, 
typically use this to conduct a study that will compare uh, program outcomes across school districts or across uh, buildings within the district to assess what programs are providing the best instruction and then duplicating those results in other districts or buildings. Um, and again, you know, the, that the uh, stimulus dollars that districts are receiving, again, designed to help districts sort of explore creative ways to address learning loss. And this is a way that districts have the ability to use some of that data to drive the decision making um, that's occurring in their district. Um, there are a couple of key points to remember when using this exception. The first one is um, the study has to be conducted in a way that doesn't permit personally personal identification of parents um, or students by individuals other than the representatives of the organization that has the legitimate education, or I'm sorry, the legitimate interest in the um, information. Uh, so the organization really needs to take steps to maintain the confidentiality of uh, the PII from the education record at all stages of the study and um, you know, lock down and make sure that anybody internally of the organization um, uh, only has access to it if they have a need to know. Um, the information has to be destroyed when it's no longer needed for um, purposes for which the study was conducted, and they need to enter into a written agreement with the community-based organization. If you go to the next slide about written agreements. So a written agreement is mandatory um, when the district shares PII under both the studies exception and the audit and evaluation exception, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, that agreement can be made in various forms. It's called different things as well. I've heard it called interagency agreements. Um, some people just call it a contract. It's also called a memorandum of understanding in some places or just a data exchange agreement. All of those things are fine <laughs> to call it that. It really matters what you put in it. Um, and there are some specific things that need to be in that um, agreement um, pursuant to FERPA. And those include the purpose of the study. So again, it has to conform to one of those allowable purposes that we mentioned earlier. Uh, you need to include information in there about the scope and the duration of the study. Um, it needs to include a description of the data that's to be disclosed and also information about how the study clearly fits into one of those three explicit purposes of the study's exception. Um, the agreement also has to state that the authorized representative, so the person who's conducting the study, will use the data only for the purposes that explicitly are specified in the agreement. They have to restrict the access to the PII only to those individuals who have a legitimate educational interest. There has to be a promise to destroy the data upon the completion of the study, and they also have to specify the time period in which the information must be destroyed. Um, a few states have state privacy laws that require more stringent components around data sharing written agreements. So uh, if you know that you're in one of those states, or even if you don't, um, it's always a good idea to consult with your attorney as you put these documents together just to ensure compliance. Um, and again, uh, the Department of Education has put together two, I think, really helpful documents that provide information about the requirements and best practices for creating written agreements um, as required by both the studies and the audit and evaluation exception, and I'll throw those in the chat. And then the last exception that we're going to talk about before we turn it over to Kelly for some um, practical uh, sort of how this plays out at City Year um, is the audit and evaluation exception. So uh, this is an exception that allows, again, educational agencies to disclose PII from education records without consent to an authorized representative for the purpose of, and there's two, two different things under this one, um, auditing or evaluating a federal or state supported education program or to enforce or comply with federal legal requirements that relate to those types of programs. And so typically what happens in this situation is that you know the, the organization, the community organization um, wants to evaluate how well their program is preparing kids for school and they'll call the district to obtain data from their data system about the program's students' performance. Um, and so in that situation, uh, you check to see if it's an authorized representative, which is defined very broadly, um, isn't limited to employees at the school district, really is anybody who is designated by the district to conduct the audit or the evaluation of the program. Um, the district has a lot of flexibility in who they determine would be best to represent them in connection with these audits. 
Um, and then you look to see if it's an education program uh, that's principally engaged in you know, providing education. So that includes groups like early childhood education, elementary and secondary education, any program that's administered by an educational agency or institution. Um, and so in these situations, again, if the district elects to conduct an audit uh, or an evaluation, um, they would need to have a written agreement that designates that authorized individual um, and also has to use reasonable methods to um, ensure that the um, authorized representative is FERPA compliant. And so again, I'm gonna plug that guidance document um, there are a lot of uh, good tips that we'll go over a little bit later that talk about um, how to use reasonable methods to make sure that the or outsourced organizations are using that information appropriately um, and are complying with the requirements set forth in FERPA. And so my last slide before we sort of turn it over is just about the written uh, agreements. So it's very similar to uh, the requirements that are in place for the written agreements for the study exception, um, but there are some different tweaks to it. So um, in this case, the written agreement has to designate the um, entity that's receiving the data as the educational agency's authorized representative. Um, the group needs to specify what uh, PII will um, be disclosed and for what purpose, remembering that this, there's those two exceptions un authorized under this, um, the audit or the evaluation exception. Um, it, the group should describe the activity in a way that makes it clear that the data sharing falls within this exception. Uh, there should include a requirement that the authorized representative destroy the personally identifiable information upon the completion of the audit or the evaluation and within the time period that's specified for destruction. And then also establish those policies and procedures um, that will protect the personally identifiable information from um, further disclosure or unauthorized use. So those are the quick exceptions, the down and dirty legal. Um, I, like I said, there's a lot of helpful resources out there from the Department of Education that um, as we turn it over to Kelly to, to sort of take the, the lead here, I will drop in the chat, but hope and happy to answer questions that come in and then we'll circle back in a little bit for um, some additional best practices that are outlined in the law. So Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. So what does this look like at Sidier? How do we, um align with FERPA and utilize that in our partnership. The first thing is we had to build intentional internal expertise and understanding FERPA. So uh, we kind of had to move out of that um, grassroots nonprofit mentality as we got bigger and really went all in in our partnerships with schools. There was a period of time where City provided multiple different types of services, not just in schools, but as we really centered on being a school-based education uh, focused nonprofit, we needed to build our internal expertise um, to ensure that we were um, treating data properly, that we were leading with privacy and confidentiality in our partnerships, and that our partners, our districts and school partners could feel safe working with us, partnering with us, and knowing that we understood um, the requirements, the federal and local requirements that come in when it comes to student data privacy. So we include FERPA, in all of our district data sharing agreements, we outline which exceptions um, apply to city or in those data sharing agreements. Um, as we were building our internal expertise before we had our own um, Office of General Counsel, we partnered with an outside law firm to help us um, write a memo that we could share with our district partners showing our alignment with FERPA. So an outside legal counsel saying like how we uh, fit with privacy law. Um, and now we have that internal capacity as we've gotten larger. Um, and so from the front end, it's, we talk a lot about FERPA, we push on FERPA, uh, we make sure that we're talking about FERPA in all of our data sharing agreements. We have written data sharing agreements with all of our district partners as well. Um, and so you can see this is some language that we just include in our data sharing agreements or in other documents where we're um, showing new partners our alignment with FERPA and how we understand and like where the exceptions apply for city year. The one nuance here that is interesting for us because we're an AmeriCorps program, so we are federally funded, um, which plays into our exceptions, um, is we also have federal record retention requirements because of AmeriCorps that apply to our data sharing agreements and extend the length of time we need to retain data after our data sharing agreements expire. So this often becomes a point of negotiation and needing to really share that information with our partners of, oh yes, 
for other federal funding we get in order to help make this partnership happen for you all and to subsidize the funding that you're providing, we also have these other requirements. So we need to be up, up front about what those are and ensure we're including that piece in our data sharing agreements as well. That's that final bullet references that. And so here's a little bit more. I know there's so many words, um, but it really is just reiterating what Sarah just talked about um, of how we lay out the exceptions around city year's use of data in our data sharing agreements. And all three exceptions apply to city year. Um, we are seen as a school official by all of our district partners because of the holistic nature of the services we provide in school and out of school. Um, and then the studies exception, we have the research. I showed the outcomes a little bit ago. We have external research to improve our program and continuously make sure that we are doing more and doing better things for kids as part of the services we're providing to schools and districts. And then as a federal AmeriCorps program, federally funded, the audit and evaluation exception applies to city year as well because we need to do that through AmeriCorps, which is formerly the Corporation for National and Community Service. So these are outlined again in the data sharing agreements we have. So going back into the best practices um, and what this looks like uh, for all of us, we'll get into what it looks like for city year. But first, Sarah, you were already talking about these agreements, but I want to kick it back to you to talk a little bit more if there's anything else here. Yeah, um, thank you. I was respond. I was going to respond to a question in the chat. So thanks for throwing it back over to me. <laughs> so um, the uh, this is actually in a couple different places. So um, one, I talked about you know the the requirement on the district to ensure that there are reasonable methods in place for ensuring that the district or the organization um, protects PII from education records. Um, the Department of Education and then the regulations that they passed um, that became effective in 2000 and either 11 or 12 actually outlined some of these best practices. So these are pulled straight from the regs. Um, and then these are the types of things that then get pulled into um, a, a data agreement or that uh, you really should work, work through with your um, provider prior and then memorialize in an agreement. So um, these are pretty consistent. You'll see these pop up. I know uh, Kelly will talk about them as well in, in some certain contexts, but um, making sure that you're you know, conveying the limitations on the data, make sure that the organization knows the limit so you know that they can only use the data to carry out the audit or enforce or comply uh, with those federal legal requirements, um, obtain assurances against redisclosure, um, it, I know that there are groups that ask to review the data prior to publication or um, you know, verify that those proper disclosure avoidance techniques that have been used. Um, be really clear about destruction. Um, what process should the groups be following in order to ensure that proper destruction of the uh, personally identifiable information is occurring? Um, do you want to maintain your right to audit or monitor the activity of the organization's policies, their procedures, their systems and processes that are in place? Um, if so, you might consider putting that in your agreement. Um, we've talked about this pretty consistently throughout this, but making sure that you're only disclosing that PII that's needed, um, you know, make, determine the specific data elements um, that are necessary for the activity. Make sure you're only providing access to those. Don't disclose um, more than needed. Um, and go back to that initial question, is, is the PII even actually needed or could the de-identified data um, suffice for the purposes of, of what you're asking the group to do? Um, the no to whom you're disclosing the data, this gets a little bit more into um, you know, what kind of check are you doing on the organization before you reach out? Um, you know, are, are, does the organization conduct background checks on individuals in the organization? Um, have there been prior issues, uh, you know, data management violation, violations or FERPA complaints filed against the organization? You know, are they a responsible data steward? Um, you know, just sort of do a little check and a little digging into the group before you enter into the relationship with them in the first place. Um, and then finally, just the existence of some, some sound data practices and training. Um, so, you know, what, what does the organization have in the way of disciplinary policies if somebody violates FERPA? Um, you know, are, are they practicing safe uh, data practices generally? Do they use encryption? Do they have uh, security audits? Are they, um, you know, disposing of their data um, properly? What happens in the event of a, a breach? 
Um, and are, you know, are there access controls, just sort of the sound data security plans that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of as a school? Um, and then what kind of training programs do they have in place to teach employees about FERPA, how to protect um, PII? I know Kelly mentioned that there was training in place at City Year. You want that, right? You want everybody to know um, what FERPA is and, and sort of how to protect the data that they're entrusted with. Kelly, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. All right. So at City Year, this can look a few different ways for us. So as I mentioned, we have data sharing agreements with every one of our school district partners. But we have City Year's data sharing agreement template when a district is agnostic to the format. And then we have some districts that, are, that want us to use their template, their data use agreement, data sharing agreement, whatever they might call it. Um, and we're fine either way. In our most basic data sharing agreement template, we include how we're going to use the data. So why we're asking for the data in the first place, what the obligations of city are, it are with the data, what the district's obligations are in the data sharing process with us, the scope and frequency of the data access and sharing. So what data we're asking for, um, who that applies to in terms of the scope of students, whether that's classroom level, grade level, whole school, um, or just for students receiving direct interventions, how often we want the data um, and what's manageable on the district side for that. We include subcontractor use of data, and this is where we also include detail about um, ongoing research as well, and when we might be disclosing aggregate data to research partners. Um, we include the FERPA detail and then ownership and protection of confidential information, so the definitions of confidential information, um, record retention, and things like that. Um, so that is like the most basic high level, but that does include, and we often end up in negotiations around what we do in the event of a data breach, um, the, the notification process, if there is a breach, um, we negotiate often around destroy versus delete data. So city are partners with Microsoft um, for some of our data visualizations and with Salesforce for data storage. Um, and we have some districts who have asked us to certify when data is destroyed and Microsoft and Salesforce don't provide certificates of destruction of data. So that is not something we can do. So we often have to negotiate around that when that's a requirement and why that may not work for us. Um, the destroy and certifying versus deleting and certifying deletion. Um, so I guess it can get very in the weeds depending on the district um, and the experiences that they've had, um, but we get into a lot of detail in our data sharing agreements. We also often, or it's not uncommon at least, to also have research proposals. So some districts also ask us to complete research proposals um, because of the program research that we're doing with our continuous improvement of our model internally as well. And so that's a separate part of the process that can go beyond the typical data sharing agreement component. All right, so another best practice is defining roles and permissions. So this is more detail on who has access to what type of information, who has access to which levels of PII and why, and the justification for that. So what this looks like at City Year is just very clearly defined roles. Who are our people? Who has access to which type of data? Is it identified? Is it just aggregate? And what's the scope of that? So our AmeriCorps members, they serve in schools um, and they work with classrooms of kids, uh, what we call focus lists of students, so groups of students that they work regularly with to provide interventions. And so our core members are receiving cohort data. That, so that might be at the classroom level, it might be at that individual like student grouping level. Our impact managers, this is where it gets a little, this is very city eyes in here, but this is the actual chart we have. Our impact managers are the staff that directly manage core members in schools. So they oversee an entire school partnership. So they get access to the data for the entire school so that they can coach our core members on the services they're providing and utilize data to improve services on a regular basis. And then that goes through to different um, site level and headquarters level staff. And most of our staff don't need to see PII. They don't need it for the function of their jobs. Sometimes they want to see it, but wanting to see it doesn't mean you get to see it. Um, and as someone who loves data, that has been hard for me. <laughs> Cause I'm like, oh no, no, let me see it. But I don't need to see it as a function of my job. There was a time when I did, when I worked at a site and was an impact manager, but that's no longer true. Um, and so we're very clear on who gets access to PII and why. Um, and then we have some people who just do work on the back end at our national office. 
our analytics and planning team, our IT teams who just are really on the system side, making sure that data is flowing and visualized and able to be seen by the right people who have access to broader data sets. But for the most part, almost no one has access to PII. All right, and then as Sarah mentioned, PD and training. This is super important. I will say this is usually not codified in our data sharing agreements, but that might be something I wanna think about changing for the future after this conversation. Um, but when we talk with our school and district partners, this is what it looks like at City. We have a pretty robust training process. If you can hear my dogs barking, I'm very sorry about that. Um, but we have a robust training process. So when we onboard any AmeriCorps member, which we do that every year, we onboard 3,000 new AmeriCorps members every year, or a new staff member, they go through training around um, FERPA and protecting student data. So you can see in the bullets what's included in that training, and then everyone has to sign a student data security policy and pledge in the organization to understand the how we need to protect student data and the repercussions if we are not doing that and what that can look like um, and what the disciplinary steps are that could lead up to termination of an AmeriCorps member or a staff member, depending on um, the level of the breach there. That's what that looks like at Sidier. And that is the presentation. Those are our best practices. That's the overview of FERPA.